Welcome to the Human Together podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Jason Floyd. Human Together is a show that is centered on humanity to create understanding and appreciation for individuals and groups that are both informative and thought-provoking. When real Democrats and Republicans were running our country, we didn't hate each other. We didn't vote for parties. We voted for ideas that came from both parties that made us better as country. We didn't label ideas or parties as racist, sexist, or un-American. We did what we thought was best for we the people and accepted the winner as a united country. A very fitting quote for this episode. Welcome back to the Human Together podcast. In this episode, I will talk about presidential libraries, a bipartisan journey. Let me start by saying I have a great deal of respect for the Office of President for the United States of America. I uphold the beliefs of our democracy and all it stands for. I truly believe we're the best country in the whole world. So when I set forth on my journey, bucket list as it were, to visit all the presidential libraries in the National Archive, it wasn't about Democrats or Republicans, it was about the office of the president itself. If it's one thing that I learned along this journey is that there was no president that was perfect. However, they did all have a mutual bond and respect for each other, no matter their political beliefs. There weren't sharp divided lines between politicians as there are today. And in fact, at the end of the day, most could go to dinner or lunch with each other and put their differences aside. And that is one thing that I respected along this journey to visit all the presidential libraries. I started my journey to visit all the presidential libraries within the archive in July of 2012. Let me begin by giving you some history and background of the libraries themselves. When you visit the libraries, you're able to pick up a passport to the presidential libraries that can be stamped and you can track your journey along the way. Inside the passport is a small narrative called A Unique Heritage, which I will share with you right now. The presidential libraries of the National Archives are not libraries in the usual sense. They're archives and museums bringing together in one place the documents and artifacts of a president and his administration and presenting them to the public for study and discussion without regard for political considerations or affiliations. Presidential libraries, like their holdings, belong to the American people. During a second term in office, President Franklin D. Roosevelt surveyed the vast quantities of papers and other materials he and his staff had accumulated. In the past, presidential papers had been lost, destroyed, sold for profit, or ruined by poor storage conditions. President Roosevelt sought a better alternative. On the advice of noted historians and scholars, he established a public repository to preserve the historical materials of his presidency for future generations, beginning a tradition that continues to this day. He raised private funds for the new facility and then turned it over to the United States government for operation through the National Archives. In 1955, Congress institutionalized this policy through the Presidential Libraries Act, amended in 1986. Through archives, museums, and public programs, presidential libraries continue to preserve the documents and artifacts of our presidents, helping us to learn more about our nation and democracy. Within the National Archives system, there are 13 presidential libraries, ranging from FDRs to George W. Bush. There are other presidential libraries that are not held within the archives, such as Abraham Lincoln's and Warren G. Harding. We'll save those for another journey. So with a mindset of democracy and a great deal of respect for the presidential office, I'm going to take you through my journey to visit all the libraries. My first visit was to the JFK Library in Boston. I had previously visited the Bill Clinton Library, but at the JFK Library is where I made the conscious effort to make this my bucket list journey to visit all the libraries in the United States. John F. Kennedy's Presidential Library was dedicated in 1979, and it overlooks the Boston Harbor. The building was designed by famous architect I.M. Pei. The building itself was probably the most impressive part, and at the end of the tour there was a 115-foot glass pavilion as you walked outside to see JFK's sailboat. All the presidential libraries have a small miniature version of the Oval Office, and I have to be honest with you, this was probably the least impressive of all the presidential library Oval Offices. However, there was a lot more to enjoy. In fact, this is home to over 48 million pages of documents, 800 million feet of film, and 400,000 photos, and 16,000 artifacts. A lot to take in in JFK's short presidential period, 
but well worth it. There are lots of historical sites in Boston, but be certain and make this part of your journey, and I enjoyed it with the whole family. My next visit to a presidential library was the Lyndon Baines Johnson Presidential Library on the campus of University of Texas, which I won't hold that against them. It was dedicated in 1971. I made this visit in October of 2012 when my wife and I, Diane, were going to the Austin City Limits Music Festival. My first visit was rather disappointing because most of the library was shut down except the Oval Office replication. However, I made a return trip in July of 2017 where I got to visit the library in its entirety. The LBJ Library is actually the biggest library under roof of all 13 libraries. One of the unique things about the library is that they have temporary exhibits. During my visit to the LBJ Library, They were focusing on PBS, Public Broadcasting System, and they actually had the life-size costume of Big Bird and some of the other Sesame Street characters. Amongst the PBS display, there was also some writings and some items from Mr. Rogers. These temporary exhibits always make for a good return visit. The next library I visited, I've actually been to three separate times, and I've always taken students along for the journey. This one is the Harry S. Truman Presidential Library, in Independence, Missouri, right outside Kansas City. It was dedicated in 1957. Like most presidential libraries, this is the final resting place of Harry S. Truman and his wife. Things of note in this library are the original sign for the buck stops here that Harry S. Truman kept on his desk during his presidency. One interesting thing I learned about Harry Truman is he was an avid reader and often visited the museum after his presidency, and he actually kept an office there at the library. The next library on the bucket list was the Dwight D. Eisenhower Library in Abilene, Kansas. This library was dedicated in 1962. I took this journey during spring break of 2013, and I drove from my home the five hours with my mom and dad and my kids. Even though it was cold and snowy, we really enjoyed the museum. There are nearly 70,000 artifacts in the museum that's contained in over five galleries, including his boyhood home. There's not a lot else to visit in Abilene, Kansas, so make this a soul journey to the Dwight D. Eisenhower Museum. Quite the opposite is true of the George W. Bush Library located in Dallas, where there's lots of things to take in besides just the museum. It was dedicated in 2013. My daughter and I actually visited that the first few days it was open. This is on the campus of SMU right there in Dallas, and it must be noted all three presidential libraries in Texas are located on college campuses. As you walk into the museum, you're going to be blown away by the video presentation and the other interactive exhibits. I've been back on several occasions to take it all in. My next presidential library visit came in July of 2014, where I visited the Gerald R. Ford Presidential Library which is located in Grand Rapids, Michigan. The interesting thing of note is the library is actually located in Ann Arbor, Michigan, on the campus of Michigan University, and the actual museum that I visited is in Grand Rapids, Michigan. I made this journey when I tagged along with my wife, who went to a week-long conference at Notre Dame University. I made the short drive from Indiana to Grand Rapids, Michigan. It was a very scenic ride along the shores of Lake Michigan. I arrived at the Gerald Ard Ford Presidential Library on a very sunny day by myself, unfortunately, but it was a wonderful trip all the same. Gerald Ford was the only president never to be elected, and he had a very short presidential term, but that did not take away from the exhibits and the artifacts that were in the museum. He was president during the bicentennial in 1976, and there was a great exhibit to commemorate the moment. One of the neat things about visiting the presidential libraries, it really is a snapshot of what was going on in history during the president's term. One thing I'd like to share with you about the Gerald Ford Library is a recent publication by Parade Magazine, who did a review of the recently renovated Gerald R. Ford Presidential Library. The majority of the museum's recently renovated 12,000 square feet of exhibit space covers Presidential Ford's childhood, World War II experience, 25 years in Congress, presidency, and post-presidency. But there are two full galleries on Betty Ford, the plain-spoken first lady the New York Times called among the most remarkable in modern history. In May, the museum will offer a documentary play. She did all that using the voices of Betty Ford. 
her family and friends, as well as new accounts and letters from her critics and admirers. Ford, the only office holder never to be elected president or vice president, was in office fewer than a thousand days. But his presidency was critical to a country rocked by the Watergate scandal and the Nixon resignation. He brought to the White House an open, unsinister, and decent style of doing things that altered the life of the country. Meg Ryan wrote in her Pulitzer Prize winning 1978 editorial. I will definitely have to return to see that. Later in that month of 2014, I made a return visit to the William J. Clinton Library located in Little Rock, Arkansas. It was dedicated in 2004. I will read a little excerpt from the Presidential Library's Passport. The Clinton Presidential Library and Museum is located within the Clinton Presidential Center and Park, which also includes the Clinton Foundation Office and the University of Arkansas Clinton School of Public Service. The Clinton Library is the first U.S. government-owned facility to earn the prestigious U.S. Green Building's Platinum Award for Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design, LEED EB. The archival and museum's holdings are one of the largest in the presidential library system. Included in these collections are 77 million pages of paper records, 1.85 million photographs, and over 20 million electronic records and over 75,000 museum artifacts. There's definitely a lot to take in, but one of the biggest marvels of the museum is the architecture itself. The building is absolutely beautiful, and you'll be blown away by the structure. The Bill Clinton Library also contains one of the most impressive representations of the Oval Office that you're really going to enjoy from almost a 360-degree angle. So I encourage you to head to the beautiful town of Little Rock, Arkansas to visit the Bill Clinton Library. I was able to visit the next museum in June of 2015 where I went to Atlanta, Georgia to visit the Jimmy Carter Presidential Library that was dedicated in 1986. Again, I went to this library by myself I was in Atlanta for a teacher conference. The presidency of Jimmy Carter can definitely be held under scrutiny, but what you can't deny is what he did after he left office. He showed true strength as a community and national leader, and it culminated with President Carter winning the 2002 Nobel Peace Prize, which is on display at the museum. After you visited the inside of the museum, take time to visit the grounds. It is beautiful. There are lots of peaceful gardens to walk through, so I highly recommend going in spring or in summer when everything is in full bloom. My next presidential library visit came to one that I had really anticipated, the Franklin D. Roosevelt Presidential Library, where it all started. This museum is located in Hyde Park, New York, and was dedicated in 1941. I made the journey to this museum in July of 2015 when we were once again in Boston visiting family. I had the honor of being driven from Boston to Hyde Park by Jeffrey Roy, a state representative in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, who was also a cousin of my wife Diane's. Jeffrey had visited the museum on several occasions and was very knowledgeable, and he acted as my daughter and I's guide throughout the museum visit. The passport has this to offer about the museum. The Roosevelt Library is the world's premier center for the study of the Roosevelt era. Designed and built under FDR's direction, the library opened to the public in 1941 and is the nation's first presidential library. It also is the only library to have been used by a sitting president. Library visitors can study the President Roosevelt used as a working office before his death in 1945. FDR and Eleanor Roosevelt are both buried on the site of the museum as well. After visiting the museum, take time to wonder about Hyde Park. It's a beautiful area along the Hudson River Valley. The next visit was to Herbert Hoover's Presidential Library in West Branch, Iowa. The museum was dedicated in 1962. I can tell you this, it is a long road trip to Iowa that I took with my mom, and we saw rolls and rolls of corn. West Branch, Iowa is a great historic town. This is the smallest and probably the most quaint of all the presidential libraries, but it was worth a visit. The museum features a total of eight galleries, with each gallery dedicated to specific periods in Hoover's life, beginning with his boyhood in Iowa. Just like the Jimmy Carter Museum, take time to wander the grounds of the library. On the grounds of the Herbert Hoover National Historic Site, you can visit the cottage where he was born, a replica of his father's blacksmith shop, a Quaker meeting house, and the former president's gravesite. Perhaps the best part of this journey was going alone with just my mom. We laughed and cried as we told stories on the long journey in the cornfields through Iowa. I wasn't through taking solo trips with my mom to the presidential library 
And in fact, the next summer, in a hot July of 2017, we headed down to College Station to visit the George Bush Library on the campus of Texas A&M. We visited the museum while President Bush and his wife, Barbara, were still alive, but Parade Magazine has this to offer about the museum. Since President Bush and his wife, Barbara, both died in 2018, the library has been busy adapting to life after 41. Welcoming visitors to come to pay respects, Bush, his wife, and their daughter, Robin, are buried on the property. And anticipating the 30th anniversary of the Americans with Disability Act, which he signed into law in July of 1990. Highlights include a new statue of Sully, a now four-year-old yellow lab who was Bush's service dog during the last six months of his life. Sully, trained by American vet dogs, answered the phone, opened doors, and picked up the items of the former president. Sully now works at Walter Reed Medical Center in Bethesda, Maryland. A full-size replica of the Oval Office is another draw. Visitors can sit at the desk and also can read the letters Bush wrote as a World War II Navy pilot. I know what it's like to be away from family. I enjoy seeing how to be handled, says marketing director David Anaya, who retired from the military in 2015. Bush's life, he said, feels like the story of having the American dream. He was somebody who loved his country and was driven by the best he could be. And for that, I salute you, George H.W. Bush. One thing I would suggest if you're visiting the library, do not go in July or August. It is extremely hot. Save a visit for this museum in cooler temperatures during the fall or the spring. The last two museums are in California, and I didn't know if I would ever make it out there, but luckily I attended a teacher conference in Anaheim, California in December of 2019. During this visit, I rented a car and drove to Simi Valley, California to visit the Ronald Reagan Presidential Library that was dedicated in 1991. This had some absolutely fantastic exhibits, including the Oval Office, a full Air Force One, an Irish pub, and Marine One. The museum had a huge glass front overlooking the Desert Valley. As I journeyed outside, I could see the charred remains caused by wildfires that recently took place in the California High Desert. Luckily, the museum was spared because of the help of 500 goats, which the museum employs every spring to eat down the shrubs around the museum. Thanks in part to the 500 goats from the 805 Goat Company, the museum was spared. While visiting the Ronald Reagan Library, I highly recommend that you visit and eat at the Reagan Country Cafe. I had the meatloaf sandwich and it was delicious. After a nice meal, stroll the grounds where you can see a remnant of the Berlin Wall. A visit to the Ronald Reagan Library in Simi Valley, California was definitely worth the wait. My last and final visit to the presidential libraries came a few days later as I visited the Richard Nixon Museum in Yorba Linda, California. The museum was dedicated in 2007. To commemorate the last journey in this bucket list, I reached out to the library and I was able to meet the head archivist and the director of the library. That was quite a treat. The significance of visiting this library last, Richard Nixon was president when I was born. Everyone knows about the travails of Richard Nixon that led to his resignation, and those are well documented in the museum itself. He was a flawed but brilliant man. The museum documented every part of his presidency in the 70s, and also on the ground is his boyhood home because the site is actually where he grew up on his family farm. Like I mentioned earlier, all the museums have temporary exhibits, and during my visit, there was one on space exploration and NASA. That was a great addition to this trip. So there it was, December 6, 2019. I got the final stamp in my passport to visit all the presidential libraries. A geeky journey, I know, but it's one that I couldn't give up on, and I knew that I would see to completion. I encourage you to visit some or all of the libraries if you happen to be in the towns that they are located. Put aside those political differences. Embrace the bipartisanship that existed with previous presidents and hope future presidents can soon follow suit. God bless America and our journey to become human together.